Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. <laughs> Thank you, uh, everybody, for coming out. Um, wanted to put a couple of things. Obviously, I see a lot of familiar faces, but also a ton of new faces, thanks to our friends over at the uh, Ann Arbor R Group. Uh, that helped co-organize this particular uh, meeting. Uh, I'd like to also thank uh, TD Ameritrade for uh, offering us this space, the venue. Uh, also to NumFocus for sponsoring the meetup group itself, as well as to Marius uh, at the University of Michigan for sponsoring the food. For those of you who are new, a couple of important points. Emergency exits, there's one right over here. And then the doors that you just came through, on your right, there's stairs to head downstairs. Uh, also, please provide any feedback, both pros, cons, uh, any critical feedback would be very helpful and useful. Uh-oh. Uh, and uh, uh, everything that we're uh, presenting here usually gets posted on our uh, GitHub page, so go check that out. Uh, unless uh, it's a quick question, try to hold it until the end, right? And then remember that you're in a borrowed space, so do clean up after yourselves. Where the food was is where the, uh, where the garbage is. I recognize that I failed to bring my code of conduct this time, but uh, the crux of it is don't be a jerk, act professionally, don't make anybody feel uncomfortable. Uh, remember that any sort of sexist, racist, uh, exclusionary jokes are not permitted. Also any, anything, yeah, just be a good person. Right? <laughs> and if you see anything, please uh, let, let me know too or hear anything, right? That's very important. Now. Uh, we have an icebreaker today. Uh, hopefully you will leave here having met somebody. Uh, either please turn to somebody to your left or to your right and uh, tell them uh, your favorite book or maybe even your favorite author. So go ahead. Hi. How are you doing? Hi. Good to see you again. <laughs> Great. So uh, just a, a quick plug for this month in data science. Uh, anybody, by show of hands, anybody here use or have used or played with Collaboratory out of Google? Right. So if you've ever uh, interacted with uh, a Jupyter Notebook, essentially it's a Jupyter Notebook, but on the uh, Google platform, uh, there is a new announcement about uh, Collaboratory, which is you can now access TPUs. So previously you could access GPUs, and so there's kind of a uh, I, if you want to play with things in the deep learning space, this would be a, a great resource for that. I'd like to also plug ne next month's uh, meetup, uh, PyData meetup, and who's going to be speaking? It is you. Right? So we're hosting our uh, sort of uh, semi-annual uh, lightning talks, so it's uh, coming from the community. So please go to the, the meetup page and sign up. I think we have four speakers right now. There's room for maybe a couple of more. They're meant to be seven minute unpolished, dirty, talk about anything that you want. Um, and yeah, and uh, yeah, please come out. It's on uh, Tuesday, November 13th. And after, in a minute, I'm gonna welcome a, a community announcements, but there is one from our friends over at Criteo down on Main Street. So they have a talk uh, with Professor uh, Ji Liang Tang. And uh, the, co the conversation will be about theory and engineering of large e-commerce apps. So uh, Professor Tang is a, uh, working at Michigan State University. Uh, looking at generative adversarial networks, so uh, very much related to the talk that we had last month. Um, were there other community announcements that anybody wanted to make, either job hires, uh, job postings, maybe you're looking for a job, anybody? Hand up. 
Uh, was there one in the back? Uh, What's your name? Adam. Adam Scarcelli is looking for uh, any position in particular? Uh, statistician. Okay, uh, statistician. Anybody else? Right over here. Um, so my name is Yuling Yu. Can you mind standing up for a second? Okay. Yeah. So my name is Yuling Yu. I'm the first year master student at University of Michigan studying information science and looking for an internship this summer in business analysis. <laughs> right over there. I'm Sia. So I'm looking for full time data. Analyst, so I did find this job, and by, by the way, I'm the second year master student in Bell Statistics. Yeah. Great, thank you. thank you. Any other announcements? Great. With that, I'd like to welcome our friends over at the uh, Ann Arbor R Group, uh, Clayton Yocum, who is a regular here at High Data, to introduce our speaker for today. Yes, so thank you, Sean. Yes, yeah, so like you said, this is a joint meetup. Not only is this Pi Data Ann Arbor, this is also the Ann Arbor R user group, who I do recognize many faces from. Thank you very much for coming out. And I would also like to encourage you guys to come back to other Pi Data meetups. Um, they are always doing very cool stuff, great content. Like you said, I think I've been to almost every one since they began, never regretted it. So if this is your first time here, I know you're going to enjoy our talk today, and I hope you come back. And to anyone that's not familiar with the Ann Arbor R user group, Find us on meetup.com. We do host regular meetups. Normally, they would be like this Thursday, but we're doing this instead. Um, and so if you are into our stuff, I encourage you to join us. And I'm super excited to, to introduce our speaker, Dr. Julia Silge. She is the author of Text Mining with, data, with Tidy Data Principles and of the R Package Tidy Text, which she'll be telling you a little more about, but I can uh, recommend it as being like the only good way to do text analysis in R. I once tried <laughs> to use some of the packages that her package uh, like wraps and builds on top of. It took me like five hours, got nowhere, and did all the same work in like 20 minutes using the tools that she's built. She has a PhD in astronomy from the University of Texas, Austin. She's a data scientist at Stack Overflow. She uh, teaches courses through Data Camp on both text mining and machine learning. So if you want to learn more about this stuff, that's a great place to go and to continue to, to hear it straight from Julia. And she's also a, a very prodigious blogger. And so you might be familiar with some of her work on the Stack Overflow blog. She has talked about things this year like their salary calculator or analyzing the results of their big developer survey that they do every year. And she also has her own personal blog. And uh, her post just last week was really good. It's called TensorFlow, Jane Austen, and Text Generation. And she walks through like a very introductory example of sort of getting your feet wet using some of these deep learning tools sorry, deep learning tools to, um, to generate text. So I recommend checking that out and hopefully she'll give you some of those like addresses at some point. And uh, with that, I would like to welcome Dr. Julia Silge. Thank you so much for that, for that wonderful welcome. I am so excited to be here. Thank you all so much for coming out this evening. And thank you so much to PyData and for the sponsors for bringing me out. This is very special to be here. I am so excited to be here talking to you about um, text mining using um, tidy data principles. So I am, um, as you, thank you so much for that wonderful um, introduction. My name is Julia Silge and um, you can find me here uh, on at Twitter and here is my website. And what I do for my day job is that I am a data scientist at um, Stack Overflow. So who here has heard of Stack Overflow? Good. Okay. If, if no one laughs, it means I'm in the wrong room, giving like the wrong talk and it's about to go very badly for me. But so that's good. So um, at Stack Overflow, as a like in my day job, I work on mainly two categories of questions. Um, and I do statistical analysis and build machine learning models. And, and one category is about um, how Stack Overflow generates revenue. Um, uh, we, we build products that help uh, companies um, engage with developers, hire developers, um, companies that want to have internal tools for developers to use. So um, how, can I, how can I use data to make all of that make all those products better and more effective for our clients. The other category of things that I work on is, um, is about the community of Stack Overflow, like the public Q&A community. So um, for example, if someone comes to ask a question, how can we make that process work better? Um, how can we scaffold someone to success? 
it, um, how can we use the data we have to understand when is this process not working? Um, and when are people having bad experiences? Um, how can we understand um, how we can make Stack Overflow more welcoming and more inclusive using the data that we have? Um, both of these, both of these are obviously connected, right? These are not like separate things that are not connected to each other, but both of them involve um, dealing with text. We have a website where people come and like they they type they type in text and we and I we have to I have to deal with it. I have to deal with this real world messy text. And I bet that this is true for a lot of you that are sitting in this room here with with me. Text data is um, increasingly important in many of the domains that we work in. Whether you work in healthcare, whether you work in finance, whether you work for a web company like I do. Um, people are writing product reviews, people are answering surveys, text data is being generated by all of these processes around them and that text contains in it information that you can use to make your customers happier, to make your products better, to make um, your the things you're building more equitable and more fair, it's, it's in there latent but I'm sad to say that um, often the, the tools and the skills that we need to get that data, that decision making information out, um, those skills are somewhat scarce on the ground. Most of us were trained on, um, like me, you know, like, like, oh, let's take this nice rectangular shaped data that has numbers in it and let's like do some analysis on it, right? Like very few of us in here probably have like, advanced computational linguistics training. Instead, instead, we're thrown into it. We're like thrown into it. We're like, oh, here's this text. What are we going to do? What is it that we're going to do? So the, what I want to make the point, the, the, the point I want to make to you tonight is that um, using tidy data principles and count-based methods for dealing with text makes text mining easier and more effective. And when I say easier, what I mean is easier to reason about and easier to integrate your text mining and natural language processing tasks into um, workflows that are already in wide use in the data analysis community, the data science community, and um, also that there's a lot of support for already. So this um, talk and this work is based on a package called Tidy Text. So this is an R package that's available on CRAN and that is um, here on GitHub. And I'm the maintainer and one of the authors of. And um, uh, we recently have a sticker. If you're a hex sticker addict like I am, I have them here. So if you would like one, come get one from me after the talk. So um, what Tidy Text offers is Tidy Text text offers functions and supporting data sets that act as a bridge, as a link between your text that you have, your raw text, and the, the tidyverse um, system of tools, the, ti the tidyverse system of tools that you have. So that if you want to be able to use um, ggplot2 for visualization, um, dplyr or tidyr for data manipulation, broom for modeling. If you want to take all those tools and use them with text, then tidy text is what allows us to have this bridge here. So um, uh, uh, Dave and I have together written a book called Text Mining with R, A Tidy Approach. And the book um, pr uh, gives you tools for getting started with this. So at the end of this, you are ready to get going. The book is available in its entirety at tidytextmining.com. Um, also, you can get paper copies. They, they also have, it is a real book that you can hold if you're interested in getting one of those as well. So I've been standing up here saying, we should, we should make our text tidy. We should make our text tidy. What do I mean? What do I mean by that? So the important thing to, to think about when you think about a tidy data structure is that it, you should have one observation per row. So let's walk through that for a very tiny little bit of text and see what we mean by that. Let's take um, the first four lines of um, one of Emily Dickinson's poems and let's convert it, let's, let's tidy it, let's transform it from this non-tidy form. This is a character vector in R, this is like a set of strings, and let's convert it 
let's transform it, let's tidy it. So let's, we can load the tidy text package and then we can use the, we can put it into a data frame and then use the function unnest tokens to end up in a tidy form. So notice here now that we have one observation per row. The observation here that we're interested in is a single word. So before we read the poem across, we read the lines across, now we're reading down. We have a long skinny data frame instead of like a character vector that's wide. Notice a few things here. Other columns that we, that we have um, are still around. They've been retained. So we still know we still know which line each one of these um, words came from. We know um, that these, these first uh, seven words came from the first line, and then we know that the next ones start coming from the second line. We still know where every word came from. Also, uh, there are some defaults, like the, the punctuation has been stripped and words have been converted to lowercase. These are defaults that are often useful for next analytical steps, but these can, these can be changed. So this is a very tiny little bit of text. So what, what happens if we do a slightly, like a larger amount? Well, let's take the six published completed novels of Jane Austen and let's tidy those. So this, this would look, would, might look something like this. This would be a tidy data structure for Jane Austen's novels. We might have some columns like, um, which book did this word come from? Which line number is this on? Like line in the sense of um, reading, leading, reading lines in a book. Which chapter is this book, is, is, is this word from here? So we, we know this for all, for all of these words here. So this would be an example of a tidy data structure for Jane Austen's novels. So this, so here we are, we, we did it. We tidied our text. It's very exciting, I know, it's very exciting. So you're, sit, you're sitting there like, what, what have we, like, okay, well, this is great. Why, why, are you, why are you talking to me about this? Okay, so the reason why this is an interesting approach, why this is an approach to consider is that now that we have tidied it, now that we have tidied it, there are many things that we can do that are, um, that are easy to reason about and easy to use standard tools that you can, and this is the reason to think about tidy data in general, not just for text. When you embrace tidy data principles, then you can use the same approach anytime that you have the same kind of data set. You can always do the same thing. You have a standard set of, um, uh, of, of things that, where you can reason about the data that you have. So for example, um, a common um, text mining task is to remove stop words. Stop words are words for some analysis that are um, not interesting. They're super common, they're not interesting. So here, um, these are from the snowball lexicon of, um, of stop words in English. They're words like I, me, myself, we, ours, and, and so forth. And they're, um, these, are, um, these, are, these are just usually not interesting for your analysis, so we would want to get rid of them. And the tidy text package lets you get these with a function called get stop words. You can get them for other languages, like here they are for Portuguese. You can get different sets of them if, if, they're, if you want to, for example, you want a bigger set, you want to take out more words versus taking out fewer words. If you want to remove stop words from a, from a set of text and you have it in a tidy data set, then you can remove it via an anti-join operation. So from, from like a relational database, anti-join. So, so in dplyr, you would do this, you take your tidy data structure, you use an anti-join with your stop words data set. And then after that, if we wanted to say, okay, what are, um, what are the most common words? Um, okay, so we, so we can use an anti-join operation, and then once we have those words out, we can say what are the most common um, words using dplyr's count. We can just count them up with sort equals true, and we can make a, 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 a visualization that looks like this. This is answering the question, what are the most common words in Jane Austen's novels? once we take out, once we remove a stop word. So it's words like Mr., Mrs., Miss. We see good time, great. We see dear, lady, sir down there. We see some of the, um, some of the um, proper names from some of her um, longest, from some of her longest novels like Fanny and Emma. 
So we were able to get here, like what are the like just word frequencies, what are the most common words via just, I mean, like not very much code, right? Like just a couple lines of code because we embrace tidy data principles. So, and so that's removing stock words. Another common task that we want to do when we're test mining is sentiment analysis. So sentiment analysis is saying, okay, we have some text and I want to say what's the emotional or, um, or opinion content of that text. One approach, a way to do this is say, okay, I have a big amount of text and I want to, I want to say the, the total sentiment score is the, is a sum of the sentiment scores of all the words that make, that make up the text altogether. So the, when you take that approach, you need a, a lexicon, a dictionary, a list, as it were, a list of words that have been pre-scored. So some score, some lists are scored like this, where they're scored from, say, this one is scored from negative five to positive five. Words are either very negative to very positive. Some are scored like this, either this is a word is a negative word, this word is a positive word. Some words are scored like, some, some lexicons are scored like this, where this is a joy word, this is a fear word, this is a sadness word, and so forth. Also, people have built, um, people that have built uh, domain-specific sentiment lexicons that are built to work for specific kinds of text. This one is built for the, for the finance domain. So um, you can imagine what might happen if you try to um, apply a general purpose sentiment lexicon to a financial document. I mean, just take, for example, the word share, right? Like share in a, in a general purpose lexicon is a positive, happy word right but in a in a fi in a financial document that is a neutral word that is a neutral word so there are this is a um, these are all um, sentiment lexicons that are included in the tidy text package that are available there and so this is one that you can use if you have financial documents you can use it to assess the um, the the sentiment um, the in the in within the financial domain so if we wanted to remove stop words, we use an anti-join. If you want in this, if you embrace tidy data principles, you can implement um, sentiment analysis using an inner join, using an inner join. So if we have our tidy data, uh, our, our Jane Austen here in a tidy, um, in a tidy data structure, and we do an inner join with one of these, um, with one of these um, sentiment lexicons. And then let's say, let's, let's count up the sentiment scores in 100 line, sen uh, 100 line chunks of the book, and then find the net sentiment, the positive minus the negative. That's what these lines are doing. And then if we plot that, we end up with a result like this. So we're able to see what is the narrative arc of the story. What is the, um, where in these stories are there a lot of positive words being used and where in the story are there a lot of negative words being used. These, um, you know, these are a little noisy, but these, um, these ups and these downs correspond to our human readings and understanding of what's going on in these stories. So probably the best known one here is Pride and Prejudice. And if you look at um, this section here about halfway through where there's a section of extended negative sentiment that's where Mr. Darcy proposes for the first time. So insultingly, and Elizabeth is so angry, and it goes very badly. And then this section, about three quarters of the way through, that's where Lydia elopes with Mr. Wickham, and it's a terrible scandal. So, so we're like we like we are measuring real events that happen in these books when we when we measure sentiment in this way. We're able to we're able to get to these kinds of insights using these tidy data principles here. One thing that's very important when you do sentiment analysis of any kind is to um, interrogate which words contribute to each sentiment. 
If you're doing a deep learning approach to sentiment analysis, that can, this can be difficult um, because you have to do a fair amount of extra work to get at this. With a tidy data approach, is, is very easy. <laughs> it's very easy to get at this. It's literally just counting with two arguments instead of counting with one argument. The reason why you want to know this, the reason why that you want to understand which words are contributing to your sentiment, uh, your sentiment scores, is because your sentiment lexicons are not always a perfect match for the text that you're studying. This problem does not go away with deep learning approaches to sentiment analysis. The way the sentiment um, models were trained may not be a perfect match to the text that you're dealing with. So you need to um, look at these. If you want to use a tidy data approach to sentiment analysis, you can look at something like this and then look at something like this and you can say, okay, how good am I doing? How good am I doing? You can say, okay, well, uh, let's look at the positive side. We've got well, good, great, like, better, enough, happy. Things are looking good. Looks like I did good on the positive side. Let's look at the negative side. Well, we've got poor, doubt, object, sorry, impossible, afraid. Those all sound sad. Those all sound like bad words. But let's look at that top word, miss. Miss. First of all, look how much more it's used than any other negative word. It's the biggest driver of negative sentiment score. What did Jane Austen use the word miss for in her books? A young lady. It's a, it's, a, it's a title. It's a title of a young unmarried woman. That's not a negative word. That's a neutral word. That's a neutral word. When we used tidy data principles, it was not hard to find this. It was not hard to find this. I have good news. It's also not hard to fix this. It's also not hard to fix this problem. All we have to do is take that word miss um, out of our lexicon. We, it's a neutral word for this text. Take it out of our sentiment lexicon. Go back, do the sentiment analysis again. Problem solved, problem solved. All right, the, th the third topic I would like to talk about is how do we programmatically get at what a document is about? So we're going to talk about TF-IDF. So the first part, part of that stands for term frequency. Term frequency means how often does a document use a word. And the second part is inverse document frequency, which is a weight. And the weight works like this. It applies to documents in a collection of documents. So think about it as like a whole bunch of web pages or a whole bunch of books or some collection of documents. Um, um, you want to take, uh, let's say, so let's say, think about that, the, all those documents. Let's say they all contain the word the. Then this ratio is one. The natural log of one is zero. And so that weight is down. That, that, that weight goes down. Let's th think about our documents again. Let's say um, only one or two of them contain some word. The, the rest of them don't contain it. That means this ratio is a, is a bigger number. The natural log is not zero, it's a bigger number. So then that weight will go up. If you take TF, term frequency, times IDF, you get TF IDF. So that's a statistic. It's a statistic, a thing we measure, a thing we measure. It's a heuristic um, quantity. It has no theoretical underpinning. It's been very successful in um, uh, like internet search. Um, it, has, it performs very well. So it's really good for understanding um, uh, doc documents and a collection of documents. So let's work through this. TF-IDF also lends itself very well to um, tidy data principles, uh, being uh, calculated via tidy data principles. So we can use some text like this to calculate a data frame that looks like so, where we say, okay, for every book, how, for every book and word, how many times does it use that word? And then how many words does the book have total? We see here which are the longest books. We see here the, the usual suspects for English, right? These very exciting, meaningful words that we're really excited to analyze. And we can make a graph that looks like this. So this is just term frequency. So there are very few words that are used a lot. So these are like the, uh, the of, 
to way out here. And then there are lots of words that are only used a very few times. So these kind of distributions are very common in natural language. So common, they have a special name. It's called Zipf's Law, Z-I-P-F, Zipf's Law. If you plot it on a log-log scale, it's like close to a straight line. So this is term frequency. Then we can calculate TFIDF. So the tidy text package has a, um, a function called bind TFIDF. If we use it here, we can find TF, which is just exactly the same as that term frequency we found before. And then IDF, which here is zero because all six of Jane Austen's novels contain these words because she wrote in English. And then we multiply these two numbers together and we get zero, right? This is, this is some thrilling stuff here that I'm showing you, but instead, let's take this data frame and let's arrange it. Let's sort it so that we see the highest TFIDF words. So the highest TFIDF words are these words. And in fact, we can make a little um, visualization here. If you're familiar with Jane Austen's novels, then you know who these people and places are. But even if you don't care about Jane Austen at all, I'm sorry um, that you're here, but um, even if you don't care at all, then you know that these are proper names, right? You can tell that these are proper names. These are the names of people and places. So let's step back for a minute and ask, what does this mean? What does this mean? This means that Jane Austen used like, like uh, consistent language from one book to the other. And the things that are most distinctive about one book compared to the other books are the names of the people and the places. That's what makes one book the most different from the other books. That's what TFIDF measures. That's what it measures. So um, it does not have to be applied to several hundred year old narrative text. It is a powerful technique that can be applied to, um, to, to many different kinds of text and including short text. We did it to, to like, a, like a novel at a time here, but you can apply it to like, um, like, like, like uh, tweet length text. Like, like, uh, there are, it's, a very, it's a powerful and flexible technique that takes advantage of um, the flexibility of tidy data principles as well. So, so far, so far, I've been talking to you about um, single words. I've been saying one observation per row, and in every row there's been a single word. But it does not have to be that way. It does not have to be that way. If the, the analytical question that you want to ask involves um, n-grams, that can be your observation, your one observation per row. A bi an n-gram is any group of n words. So a bigram is a group of two words, a trigram is a group of three words, and you can analyze, you can tokenize um, two n-grams using um, tidy text. You can do many different kinds of tokenization uh, using tidy text, including n-gram tokenization. And then um, a enormous world of analytical possibilities are open to you. For example, one example you can see in the book is to look at networks of words. Which words co-occur together? More, which words are more likely to occur together than not? You can look at negation. You, you can get at, so for example, the sentiment analysis approach that we talked about, which is um, sometimes called bag of words, sentiment analysis, um, does not take into account negation. It looks at the, the sentence, uh, this is not good. And it's like, I don't know, use the word good. I guess that's really good sentence or whatever. So you can use n-gram, bigram analysis with negation words and you can, you can measure for your text how often are you um, getting it wrong and use that to understand, um, like to put uncertainty on your measure of your sentiment analysis. One analysis I did um, that, I, that I love as an um, example of the power of these kinds of N, M, these n-gram analyses is to look to take um, uh, Jane Austen's novels and to find all the, the bigrams that have he or she in the first, um, the first space. And then look at what comes in the second space and to look for differences between um, what is more likely to come after she versus what is more likely to come after he. 
So in Jane Austen's novels, women are more likely to um, remember, read, feel, resolve, long, hear, dare, cry. Men are more likely to stop, take, reply, come, marry, seem. So we see here that uh, we see here um, evidence for how much Jane Austen's novels are about the internal lives of women. Like it's about like what women think and feel, and the 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 male the um, the men. The verbs associated with the men are very much about like actions and kind of like what they're doing because because it's it's not about the internal lives of men like that's not what she's writing about so we can understand here like uh, how an author handles gender by doing this kind of text mining analysis. I was able to extend this analysis with um, uh, by partnering with the data visualization, data journalism experts at uh, The Pudding on this project called um, She Giggles, He Gallops. So they have a, a large data set of film scripts. And what we did was we took the film scripts and we scraped out the, we removed, we removed the, um, the dialogue so that all that was less left was the um, set direction. So this is this is the part of the scripts that tells the actors what to do, like wh what actions to take, um, what you know facial expressions to have, and all these kind of things. And then I repeated the same kind of analysis: what are um, what is more likely to come after he, and what is more likely to come after she. So we see here. Um, like she snuggles, giggles, squeals, sobs, weeps, and then we, and then we see here things in the middle, the things that are um, e very equally likely to come after men and women, or like for he and she, like um, waits, gets, chooses, obviously takes, decides. These are things that are even. And then the things that are more likely to come after he. So it's things like honks, r rams, releases, clears, prize, um, um, shoots. Like these are the things that are more likely to come after he. So what I love about this example is it shows how we can take um, this text mining analysis and use it to explore um, what are the stories that we're telling ourselves about who we are. We're able to understand um, uh, um, use these kinds of tools that we're building that I use in my day job like uh, to help Stack Overflow be a thriving place and actually use it to understand um, uh, like, uh, like what is our like what is our cultural perception and do we want it to be that way and what can we do to um, what what, uh, what can we do in, in the kind of media that we choose to um, to take in so I have been here up here Preaching the gospel of tidy data. I've been saying tidy data, everyone. It is so good and so important. But it turns out text data does not need to be, or perhaps does not always, should, should not always be in a tidy data structure. In fact, sometimes it's really great to have data in a matrix so that you can do math on it. Turns out it's just really, it's really helpful sometimes. So um, we talk about uh, the, this transformation back and forth in terms of the verbs tidying and casting. So tidying is the verb we mean to say to go to a tidy data structure and casting is the verb to go um, to a non-tidy data structure. And non-tidy doesn't mean bad or messy. It just means like not one observation per row in that kind of data frame that we've been talking about. So for example, a document term matrix would be an example of a non-tidy data structure for text. So you might end up with some kind of a, um, a workflow that looks like this, where we have our like your raw text data over there where it says text data. You can make it go to, we, we use unnest tokens to go to tidy text. You can do um, uh, EDA here with like your summarized text and, and gain a lot of insight here. Um, but one thing you can do from the summarized text is you can go down here to a document term matrix. And once you have a document term matrix, you can build models. You can do a great variety of kinds of machine learning algorithm on a document term matrix. And then once you have your document term matrix, you, you, we in TidyText have support for tidying the output of those because often um, the people who have implemented these machine learning algorithms uh, often give, it, give you those outputs as these like 
S3 objects that are not so convenient, in my opinion, to work with. And so we will tidy them for you so that you have a data frame at the end. And then you can use dplyr, tidyr, ggplot2 to, to um, make visualizations of what you have at the end. So, um, so one example here is topic modeling. So topic modeling is unsupervised machine learning method for saying, okay, I have a whole, I have this text. I believe there are latent topics in it. I think something's going on in here and I want to find out what they are. So I have a, a blog post um, on the Stack Overflow blog about topic modeling of Stack Overflow questions. And uh, it's, a, it's a very interesting result because we did not tell the topic modeling procedure about the tags, about the Stack Overflow tags. But the topic modeling procedure grouped questions with related tags together. So for example, topic one up there, whoo, that got real small. I apologize for that. Okay, so topic one is um, CSS, HTML, jQuery, JavaScript. Like those are front end web technologies. Topic four here is um, SQL, MySQL, SQL Server, um, C Sharp, and Oracle. So we got like, like, um, uh, SQL things all together. We um, topic twelve down here is iOS, Objective C, iPhone, Swift. Like these are these are um, uh, uh, Apple mobile technologies. So the 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 topic model learned the underlying latent topics in Stack Overflow questions. Um, if you're interested in getting started with um, topic modeling in R using this kind of approach, I have a um, I have a blog post and a YouTube video um, uh, tutorial for getting started with the STM package, which is my current favorite implementation of topic modeling in R. It is written in C++. It's fast, easy to install, works really well. And you, we also are able to address questions like, like how many topics should you pick for K? Like what, what is the appropriate number of topics for any given corpus? So often you'll see, you'll see approaches that have um, little baby toy um, data sets and you're like, we know, you know, like I artificially put like four things in there so we know it's like the you know like doing k means on the iris data set right like woohoo we got three you know like good for us um so i have i have um a blog post of like how using a realistic data set how do we decide k like how do we decide the number of topics in this kind of unsupervised machine learning approach and so look so here for example um so this is about how well did the how, this is about how well did the model um, converge. Semantic coherence measures um, is, a, is a measure of um, um, how, how, how much do the words in the topic mean the same thing and it always goes down um, uh, in this way. You just want to see like is there some kind of a bend in it or whatever. But then over here this is um, if, you, if you make held out um, data sets um, what, what is the uh, likelihood for when you fit the model, the model you fit on the full data set, how does it do on like held out data sets? And then this is residual. So here we want residuals to be low, we want likely to, to be high. So this one is very nice. It's like pretty clear where we want to be for K for this kind of data set. So um, we can look at that there. And then we're going to end with the last thing that we're going to talk about tonight is text classification. Um, so we've gone, we started at like counting things, counting, and we're gonna, we're gonna, we went through unsupervised, we went through TF-IDF, sentiment analysis, a little bit of unsupervised learning. We're gonna end with supervised, supervised machine learning, some text classification here. Um, so we started with some, um, some Emily Dickinson, some Jane Austen, and we're gonna, we're gonna end with a combo a combo of our friend H.G. Wells here and Jane Austen. And we're gonna walk through how you would train um, a GLM net model, which is um, regularized regression, a regularized regression model. And we're gonna see, we're gonna walk through how well, or how would you train a model to tell the difference between um, Pride and Prejudice and War of the Worlds. 
So, um, so the way that this is trained is it's trained line by line. So it's like you take each of the books and you chop them all up. You chop them all up into single lines and then um, uh, uh, train it using cross-validation. And then, and then um, I probably, I don't think I included, um, but I, I have a in-process blog post of um, how to do like ROC, AUC, all that business to see like how, to measure how well it does. Um, well, so let's walk through this. So uh, here we go. Yeah, okay. Okay, so if we take a, um, we take our tidy data set, we count them up, we summarize it, and then we cast to a sparse matrix. So uh, this is really great, and I have found this to be um, very useful in my real life day job. Um, this approach of using sparse matrices and GLMNet has been very, very effective in my um, actual real life day job for if I need to train some kind of text classification model. So um, R does not have a native sparse matrix type, but they have uh, implementations of it in the capital M matrix package. So you can use that to create this data, this sparse matrix. And then we're going to make a, um, a data frame here that is going to tell us, okay, with the row names, which is going to tell us the document number, I need to know, um, I need to know the title. I need to know the title for each one of these guys. However you made the sparse matrix, I need to know which, um, which, uh, which book did it come from? Did it come from War of the Worlds or did it come from um, Pride and Prejudice? And then um, we can uh, load up the GLMNet package and the GLMNet package is, I, I would say actually my workhorse when it comes to, um, to like supervised machine learning and like what, what I need to do when it's like when it's when it's like it's time to get down to it like what I'm going to do um, we can use um, take advantage of um, parallel processing here we're going to find a make a response variable this is the y the y variable that we're going to predict um, I'm calling it is Jane so this is a true false it's a logical vector um, when it's when it's the pride and prejudice it's true when it's war of the worlds it's false so we have a whole bunch of true false true false true false and then we can with cross validation predict uh, or train a model here um, train on our sparse matrix our sparse matrix is the response the X is Jane is the Y, and here I'm going to train um, uh, um, uh, 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 binomial, the family equals binomial. I'm so I'm going to I'm going to retrain um, logistic regression, a logistic regression model here, and then because the output of GLMNet is not not really what I want to deal with. I want to deal with a data frame. I'm going to use Broom, and I'm going to tidy the output. So notice I started with something tidy. I cast. I did my machine learning. And now I'm going to tidy what I have here at the, as the output so that, I can, um, so that I can get out the output here. I'm going to choose, so regularized regression, it tries a whole bunch of lambdas, like it tries a whole bunch of um, uh, values for the regularization parameter. And so here I'm going to pick the one that minimized the error, the one that uh, minimized the cross-validation error here. And then I'm going to say, OK. Um, find my intercept there, and then I can make a plot that looks like this. Cool. So these are the coefficients that increase or decrease the probability of the classification. So, we, so remember, what were my, what was I training on? A, a sparse matrix of words. That was what was, that's what I was training on. So um, the, these blue bars, those are the ones that increase the likelihood of something being written from coming from Pride and Prejudice. And these here in the red bars are the things that decrease the likelihood of it coming from there. So things that mention Elizabeth, Longbourn, Family, Kitty, Meriton, Wickham, Letter, Jane, and she. <laughs> these are all things that are more likely coming from Jane Austen. And, Martians, <laughs> smoke, heat, cylinders, p black pits, or red, red pits. These are things that are more likely to be coming from War of the Worlds. So, so this, is, um, this is some of the output that we get from, um, 
from the output that we get from this GLM net model. So like, if you're interested in this kind of approach, uh, you can, of course, like use this and get started yourself. But you can look for, uh, I'm, I'm working on a blog post about how to uh, start from here and then calculate on, um, on ROC, on AUC, um, be able to do all the other uh, supervised machine learning things that we have there. So as I sum up, uh, here's what I want to emphasize. We went through a lot of text mining things that we want to be able to do. We talked about TFIDF, we talked about sentiment analysis, we talked about unsupervised machine learning, supervised machine learning. We went through a lot of content really fast. There are resources out there from me and for others about how to implement the details of any of these things, like blog posts, my, um, our book. And what I want you to take away from this tonight is that tidy data principles make these things make um, 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 push can push you to fluency to um, to being able to take the text you have and being able to take that step to be able to moving forward with that. And with that, I'll say thank you. So we have time for a few questions, but I will ask you that please uh, phrase your question in the form of a question rather than a statement or a comment. But we do welcome you to you know, provide comments afterwards too. Um, that would be lovely. And I do have I do have stickers if you would like a sticker. Yeah. Uh, let's start with I was just curious. You didn't seem to mention like stemming or at all. Do you prefer redundant lists of stop words with different? Verb endings and stuff like that, or is that not part of your workflow? So this question was about stemming, and because I didn't mention stemming, and like how how would I approach stemming? So there are some um, packages out there for stemming in R, if that's your if that's your preferred workflow. Um, there also are some very interesting academic papers about the dangers of stemming. Are you all ready to hear about it? <laughs> okay, so stemming, people just like oh yeah default, time to stem, time to go about my business and stem my words. But the people, the academics who study this um, have shown that when you stem words, you, um, you, uh, you reduce the, um, uh, so for example in topic, this has been studied pretty well in topic modeling. If you stem your words before you do your topic modeling, you um, reduce the coherence, um, you reduce, basically everything good you can measure about your topic goes down. And, and anything good, it doesn't get any better. You, you, basically there's no, at the best, at best, stemming doesn't hurt you. At worst, stemming has a negative effect on your topic modeling. Um, so if you wanna Google this for yourself, uh, the, um, look at the work of David Mimno. There's a, t there's a great paper called um, Comparing Apple to Apples. That's the title of it. It is wonderful. And it is very rigorous and shows like what is the effect of stemming. The, I mean, if you want to think about it, basically, if you, um, if you have enough data, like if you have enough data to get the signal out, it doesn't it will just put those in the topic together or it will just if you're doing supervised supervised learning it will just put those together like it will it will it it, it, it the algorithm will um, if they belong together they will go together um, if they if you force it if you force it together by stemming and it didn't really belong together then you're hurting yourself so that's that's if you want to think about it conceptually that's the basic basic idea Okay, so lemmatization. I haven't seen as much detailed work on it yet, like detailed academic work on it yet. Because I noticed, like, for example, on your text classification, you had Martian yes. and Martian. Yes, 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 yes. So it put Martian and Martians together. Is that bad? No, no, the algorithm knew to do that. Nothing went wrong. It put them together. Nothing is wrong. Nothing happened wrong. Um, it, at best, stemming doesn't hurt you. But it can't, like it can hurt you. It does not improve, does not, it, so it doesn't, so it doesn't improve um, um, the, anything you can measure about the, imp the performance or the, um, the, the characteristic of your topic modeling or whatever. So it is possible for your data set, it might, so this is something that if you're like training supervised models, you should try it both ways and do whichever one works better, right? It's, but it's not a guarantee 
that stemming is going to help you. So it should not be a default choice because, um, because it may not. In fact, it has been shown that it often does not. Is there a certain type of file you use that retains those line numbers? Does it arbitrarily assign line numbers? Is there another way to break down tax outside of the line numbers? So this question was about um, the sentiment analysis plots that where you could see like the narrative structure, and um, I, I divided them into a um, um, hundred line chunks. In that section, that plot pushed put together a hundred line chunks. I've made m multiple versions of that plot. Um, since we started the book with like 70 line chunks, 80 line chunks, it ends up being like a issue of um, signal to noise, like how many, um, it's a smoothing, it's a smoothing factor effectively. I mean, if you want to know the details of like what does a line mean there, a line is how, um, how is that text encoded by Pro Project Gutenberg? What are they calling, what are they calling a line when they encode that um, book? So it's it's a it's a smoothing factor, and so that is a that is a um, art not science issue there. You know when you're saying like what should we do to make a, um, a, a issue there? And actually, there's some very interesting academic research on this issue because uh, you may have seen this actually like making the rounds. Like there's only six kinds of stories, everyone. Like you may have seen this go around. Like they took. Um, you know, like a hundred thousand novels, and then they did that kind of thing. They very, very close to what I did, and then they fit smooth lines to it. And um, that how smooth the lines are is a parameter in that. And so, depending on how smooth you want to make your lines, <laughs> makes a difference. And like how many stories you want to say there are in the world. And and also, people have done things like. Um, uh, Fourier transforms um, of that, but but a Fourier transform um, always like a low pass Fourier transform always begins and ends at the same amplitude. <laughs> so it's like, what are you doing? You know, like so. So these are. Um, I'm not saying these are bad approaches, but I'm saying they're they're parameterized approaches, and the parameters you choose affect the output you get. So, you, so if you were to take them, you need to think about how robust is the um, conclusion that I'm coming to? How robust is it um, to the decisions I'm making? So we have time for maybe one more question. Maureen? So there's a good fan, um, talk around getting to the point with NLP, like they are with image recognition, where there's like these pre trained models and you just did transfer learning and it's like a, 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 a topic. To it. So, I, where do you think we are in terms of getting to that point? And do you see that as a desirable thing or do you see using that in your work? Or? So, this question was about. Um, <clears throat> Um, state of the art, deep learning for natural, long, la natural language processing, um, uh, like transfer learning for natural language processing. Um, do like do we think uh, like is this is is the future here? Is it here now? Are we having this now? So first of all, I am actually very interested in this because there are. Um, there, so I showed you this GLMnet model, and I've had a lot of success. For example, in my like in my real day job, using this to predict something like, for example, um, how senior a developer is based on um, things they type in, or you know, like stuff like this. But when you get to more, if you want to take text and you want to learn, um, or you want to predict something that is embedded more subtly. Um, then using word counts um, will probably not get you there, right? Like using word counts is not going to get you to um, more subtly encoded um, semantic meaning. I'm interested this, in this, for example, when it comes to um, trying to understand um, snark and unfriendliness on Stack Overflow, right? Like, like is our word counts going to get me there? Only for like extremely offensive words, right? And that's not really Stack Overflow's main problem is extremely offensive words. So, um, so I think that this is an area that is um, um, promising and interesting, these deep learning approaches. They are interesting, I think, for a different category of problems um, uh, than some that you might use here. And they have different pros and cons. For example, um, one big con is if you start with a 
existing pre-trained model, like say some set of word embeddings or, or even some like existing pre-trained classifier and you're just gonna like lay on your like frosting of sprinkle on your like little bit of data on the top for transfer learning. Those are, are pre-trained on large, a large corpus of data from somewhere. And that is, um, uh, those have very impactful um, biases in, written into them. Um, for example, if you train um, a sentiment analysis classifier using um, like, like some of these very big um, prominent data sets that are used for these, like, um, like the Google News data set, or like that's the one I think I've seen uh, the, the biggest problems with. Um, if, you, if, you sent, if you train a deep learning sentiment analysis predict, predictor, like a classifier, um, you end up with things like um, uh, very simple sentences being, um, having, being predicted as like negative sentiment when they just use very simple um, very simple um, names or words that are um, that that are um, have have racial identity. You know, like you have someone using a like like let's let's go get Italian food, being very positive, and let's go get Chinese food, like mildly negative, and let's go get Mexican food, classified as very very negative. If you train these classifiers, that's what happens when you use these large corpuses because the way people have used language in the corpus affects your model. Um, and and this is something there are people are working on like ways to get around this, what are we going to do? But if you start, if you start with something existing that is black boxy, um, these, like, these are the important issues you need to be aware of. Great. So that's all the time that we have today. But I encourage everybody to come up, say hello, grab a sticker. And I also want to encourage everybody to grab uh, Julia's book as well. So let's uh, give Julia a, a round of applause. Thanks. Thank you.